Welcome to a meeting of the Town of Arsenal Comprehensive Financial Advisory <clears throat> Committee. Today is April 22nd, 2024. This meeting is being recorded by the Town of Arsenal and will be broadcast on Channel 8 after the meeting has concluded. If it, there is anyone here who is planning to record either through audio or video, please let us know. The agenda for this meeting is available on the town website. We'll call the meeting to order. And Chuck, if you will call a roll, please. Well, Lillian. Here. Tom. Here. Chris. Here. Jackie. Here. Uh, I was going to call Hector, but it looks like he's just joining. Has Hector, Hector just joined? Hector, are you with us? Um, well, I know I'm here. Um, so uh, I'm the and man. Jim, did you get Jim? And there's Jim. Hello, Jim. Yeah. Hi. How are you? Good. So even without Hector, we have a quorum, but with him, we'll be Okay. Back. I'm Thank here. You. Sorry. There Thank he you. Sorry to be late. And I, and I will announce um, to everyone before we start that our member, Neil Kleinfeld, has resigned. And uh, we're sorry that he's gone, but we really appreciate all his contributions to our committee and his service to the town of Barnstable. Our first, uh, um, is there any public comment? Not hearing any. Let's move on to the um, approval of the minutes. Oh, uh, we're going to start with the minutes of March 25th. Is there a motion to approve? I move. Is there a second? Second. second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the March 25th meeting. Um, are there any corrections or changes? As usual, Teresa has captured everything. Not hearing any, then we will take a vote on it. Uh, Chuck? Yes. Uh, Hector? Yes. Lillian? Yes. Tom? Yep. Chris? Yes. Jim? Yes. Jackie? Yes. And Chuck is yes, so they are approved. Thank you. Our next set of minutes are the, from the last meeting of April 8th. Is there a, a motion to approve? So move. I move. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the April 8th meeting. Are there any changes or corrections? Good job, Jack. Teresa. All right, not hearing any. Um, Chuck, if you will take the roll, please. All righty, Lillian? Yes. Hector? Yes. Tom? Yes. Chris? Yes. Jim? Yes. Jackie? Yes. And Chuck is yes, so we're approved. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll now move on to our discussion. Uh, we're going to start with, we're, as you know, we're doing the operating budget for fiscal 25, and we will start with the police department. We welcome Chief Chalice and our good friend, Anne Spillane. Wherever they may be. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you guys. It's good to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, we have a PowerPoint to share with you to go over our numbers. Um, I'm going to have our IT guru show me how to share this with you. Share screen. Go ahead and do PowerPoint presentation. So, beginning. And then just get Which one? Did you say anybody? Uh, anybody. <laughs> I think I'm just hitting any button. Right? Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So we'll go over our um, budget and then some of the um, highlights and challenges that we're facing. Um, thanks very much for your time tonight, and we'll um, 
hopefully be able to answer any questions that you have. Not that much. So um, this just gives you an overview of our proposed budget for FY25. Um, does show an 8.74% increase from FY24, um, breaking it down into our personnel operating operating capital budget with a total of $18.7 million. The um, recommended funding requests um, include our vehicle replacement, which um, will include eight vehicles. Uh, five of those are patrol vehicles. One of them is a supervisor's vehicle, and then there's two unmarked detective cars. Um, we have an increase in cost for our IT services, and then the final year of our technology equipment purchase. Um, so that's the increase in the cost for those. We are facing an increase in training materials. We've generally not included materials in our training budget, um, but this year, because we are looking at um, optics for our firearms, red dot optics, and um, we are looking to train several firearms instructors and the ammunition is increasingly expensive. Um, we are requesting money for um, the ammunition for both training new firearms instructors and for recertifying those that we have. And then we're also gonna be implementing a roll call uh, training program that will be available to all police officers here. Um, we have a request in for overtime funding uh, due to the increasing costs of training and um, that will increase our overtime budget, uh, but it'll cover our overtime cost because with people working all three shifts and the training primarily happening in the daytime, um, obviously most of our officers have to do their training on overtime. We have um, an increase in our costs of software licensing primarily over, over this year. Um, Anne did a great job and actually looked at every uh, license that we had for all of our software programs and um, was able to figure that the cost of that um, needed to be covered uh, anticipated that nicely. Uh, the tasers that we carry are no longer going to be in service. Taser is phasing these models out. They have not really been in existence for a very long time. The first ones that we carried, the X-26, lasted almost 10 years. These ones have not lasted that long. And Taser is implementing a new device, um, which is actually great. We got to try it out at Taser training a couple of weeks ago. But um, they're also not allowing us to purchase the equipment anymore. They are going with leases only. So the cost of that lease annually uh, is the 109 089, so that's a five-year lease, so it'll be that cost every year for five years. And we've also requested funds to increase the pay for our jail attendance. Um, so that'll be, we're asking uh, to increase that to $24 an hour. It's not only to keep them competitive with other jail attendants, but just also the market in general, um, but it is a really difficult job and they're in a, um, Kind of a tough setting sometimes and they see some kind of rough things so um, we truly appreciate their service and we wanted to keep it competitive uh, with surrounding police departments and just the market in general and the final um, recommended funding request was for our body cameras um, we did apply for and receive a grant which covers the equipment however this particular amount is for um, the licensing and the data storage. So um, that amount will be recurring every year for the five years of our um, our lease of the body cameras. Can I ask a, uh, just a, a minor question on the tasers? When you move to a lease arrangement, um, I assume uh, there's a service element associated with that. So if they break or misfunction, the 
or, or but I don't know a if that's right and b I don't know what it was like when we owned them. Maybe there was a service contract then too. I just wonder if there's a difference in you know maintenance and servicing when you lease versus buy. So they will service and maintain the tasers for us uh, when we owned. So the, the devices are far more complex now as well. So when we owned those first tasers and we owned them for a long period of time, they deployed one cartridge at a time and you had to manually remove the cartridge and then put the other cartridge in. Um, these new tasers actually hold, I believe it's up to 10 um, and they're different cartridges. So they are just a much more complex and complicated device but these will cover the, the cost of maintenance and um, service. How many, Thank you. How, how many uh, tasers are there in this in this lease? This covers a device for, for everybody. So it's a 118. Yeah. Okay. How about with the body cameras, how many officers will be wearing those? Everybody will receive a body camera. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. So some of the highlights uh, for us moving forward, the body cameras are gonna be deployed starting in late April. Uh, so we're almost there. We have um, some of the officers will be um, beginning to wear them at the end of the month and the rest of them will be rolled out shortly thereafter. Um, mm -hmm. We went with Axon as our vendor because they uh, have a very high quality product and they also use a program called evidence.com which allows us to manage our digital evidence more easily. Uh, officers will be able to upload not just the body camera footage but any other digital evidence or, that they secure whether it's uh, footage from a retail store or from a ring doorbell or anything. Um, photographs can be uploaded and um, it can be seamlessly transferred over to the district attorney's office. So it's a, a very user-friendly program uh, and it won't cause undue delay when they're working with that digital media. Um, we are moving forward with cameras. We were able to purchase seven overt cameras. Uh, those will be primarily put in the Main Street area to help with increasing security in the Main Street area. Uh, we purchased those with a grant um, along with two license plate readers, and those will be um, used to assist with investigations. So <clears throat> the license plate readers allow us to um, access information when we need to know whether somebody has um, left or entered town as part of an investigation. And then we are hopefully moving forward with a comfort dog. Um, the school resource officers have done a tremendous job and they created a 501c3 <clears throat> along with some members in the community and they are in the process of securing um, a lab <laughs> from Freedom Labradors and uh, the dog will primarily be in the schools but will be available in the building or in the community as needed should we have a um, critical incident. And so are, are, these, are these comfort dogs separate from the canine unit? Yes, they are. How many, how many comfort dogs do we have? We would only be getting the one. I see. Thank you. Sure. Uh, some of the challenges that we're facing are uh, the ongoing impacts from police reform. We um, unfortunately do not have any control over when uh, the post commission or the training council send out new training mandates. These are always unfunded. And just as an example, they required an additional four hours of taser training annually. They've also required an additional four hours of firearms training annually and they've required our school resource officers to have specific in-service training. Uh, none of it's funded, and they seem to always send it out in the middle of the fiscal year. So um, you sort of have to roll with that, but uh, the mandates come and 
you know, we've been very fortunate that we've been able to um, handle these demands, but it is definitely a challenge to balance the needs of the training requirements that are coming out. In addition, there's a lot of reporting requirements that have uh, come from police reform, including reporting all uh, complaints. So the post commission requires that any complaint be reported to them within two days. And if you don't meet that deadline, you have to give them a valid reason why there's a delay. Um, the post commission has their own investigators. So any type of complaint against an officer has to be reported. They can file their own. People don't have to complain to us. They can actually complain right to post. Um, the post commission can investigate the complaints on their own. They can demand the final report once we've completed a report uh, and everything is available online for anyone to review. So you can go online and Google Massachusetts Post Commission and then it'll have um, officers discipline records right there. So that's um, taken some adjusting for everybody. And then every year we also have to recertify one third of the department. So this year it will be the bottom third of the alphabet. Um, and then next year it will be the top of the alphabet. So every year an off officers have to fill out a questionnaire. Um, it involves questions regarding any type of social media presence they have. Um, basically they have to um, answer questions regarding their on duty and off duty conduct. And then I have to attest to their good moral character. And tell post whether I am willing to attest that they should be certified as police officers or not. So those are just the post um, issues that we face. And although it was started in 2020, uh, it's sort of been a gradual rollout of all of these requirements. Does these anybody are have any questions? <laughs> What, are, what does the recertification include? It's a number of questions, um, like I said, about their training. They have to have maintained all of their training. You have to send all of your training certifications. Um, they wanna know whether or not you've um, made any derogatory statements regarding any groups on social media. Um, they need to know whether you have any pending complaints, any pending lawsuits. Um, it's it's a pretty in-depth questionnaire. Mm. And then at the end of it, I have to sign off uh, as far as whether or not I would attest to their good moral character. Thank you. Sure. Anybody? This is all very time consuming, doing all these, it takes a great deal of time <laughs> to put all these things together. So in addition, um, some of the other challenges we're facing include recruitment. Um, as a civil service police department, and actually the only one on the Cape proper born, I believe is still also civil service, but otherwise there's no other police departments on the Cape that are civil service. Uh, we are having struggles with recruitment. Um, we are bound by the civil service process, which I would be happy to uh, explain in depth, but. Suffice to say, it's incredibly lengthy and cumbersome. Um, the test is only offered one time a year. And um, it takes a very, very long time to get results and to get a list of eligible candidates. And then from there, um, you have to follow very stringent rules with regard to how you hire officers. And if you don't follow those rules or somebody who's in the hiring process disagrees with the decision that you make uh, in terms of not selecting them, they have rights of appeal and the Civil Service Commission um, has to review and approve reasons why you don't hire people. So you really don't have a lot of autonomy when it comes to hiring when you're a Civil Service Police Department and there's a lot of Civil Service oversight and it slows everything down tremendously. Um, it causes real problems when you're surrounded by non-Civil Service Departments and Somebody can go right next door to Yarmouth, which is a fabulous place to work and hand them an application and set up an interview and be ready to go to the next police academy. And we're still bogged down by um, the schedule that civil service sets. So that's a real, that's a real issue for us. 
we currently have eight vacancies um, with a number of people who are out of work on long-term absences who are likely also going to result in vacancies <clears throat> and there's just no way to fill them. We can't get ahead. Um, one of the other things that we've been working actively on since September is managing some of the employees who are out of work on these long-term absences. We've been trying to engage them and bring them back in, having face-to-face -face conversations to try to assess their ability to work or return to work, even in a light duty capacity, because these um, employees being out of work creates um, a real significant drain on our overtime budget. And even though in a, no a number of other departments, vacancies can create vacancy savings, for us, vacancies create overtime. And especially when you get someone who's out of work but being paid, um, we're not only paying their salary, but then we're paying overtime for another officer to come in and fill their shift. So vacancies for us spell trouble when it comes to our budget. And um, we currently right now are down 21 people. So when you take a staff of 118 and you are down 21, it really is putting a tremendous strain on the officers who are here every day because they're being forced to work shifts. And um, we are trying hard to bring the people who are out that can come back, back to work. And we're trying to deal with recruitment issues. Are those 21 vacancies all officers or does that include other positions? That's all sworn personnel at varying ranks. Okay. And the civil service part of it, town council is considering removing that, correct? Has Hi. that been discussed? It has been, yes. That's in the very early stages, but we are hopeful that well, we can come to some agreement on how to move the department. Chief, why have we kept the civil service component for so long? <clears throat> I believe that there just really hasn't been any um, appetite to move it out, but we are really reaching critical mass, especially with all of the other Cape departments leaving. Um, it's created a huge problem. And I think civil service was a, was a bit of an issue when you had, it was enough of a hardship when you had, say a hundred Barnstable residents take the test um, and you had to go through these hurdles, over these hurdles and, and follow the civil service rules, that, that was enough of a problem. But now when you have only six residents take the test, um, it creates such a tremendous hardship. I think it's really been sort of a post um, anti-police sentiment problem that has really compounded the need to get out. Um, so ever since police reform kicked in, um, since there's been so much anti-police sentiment, since people really haven't sought this job out as a career path in the past four or five years, we've really seen it snowball. So I think um, we've known it. I just don't think anybody's taken the steps to do it until now. Thank what you. Are biggest, what are the biggest challenges for recruitment? Um, I think... Well, for one thing, um, you have to love the job. <laughs> and I think people have made it look like it's a really awful job because there's been a lot of negative media and press coverage. This is going back a few years, but I think right now in the immediate, I think it's really difficult for people. Um, the process is very lengthy. So for us as an agency, when you take the test, for, you have to sign up for the test by January, you take the test in March, you might not get hired for, that list is good for two years. You might not get hired for two years. So it's not a situation where you apply for the job and you get the job uh, within two months or six months. It's sort of something where you put your hat in the ring and you see if it works out, but you have to continue on your path of life. And this is just a bonus if it happens. Um, so that I think that makes it difficult because people can't count on it. And then I also think that um, even though we've opened up the list beyond the town borders, because generally civil service wants you to hire your own residents, we've opened the list up to the statewide list 
when we get people that come down here from um, elsewhere, you know, from Fitchburg or New Bedford or wherever they come down from because they have an interest in working here, once they realize that it's a long ride and that housing is prohibitively expensive and that there isn't housing available, um, most of them drop out of the process. So we've started a process, we had 470 names uh, at one point and we ended up hiring one candidate. And that's because he actually lived in Hanover and his girlfriend had a house in Sandwich. Um, but we've lost so many people because after a while, they just get sick of dealing with the drive, housing, the expense of everything. And, um, you know, there's obviously other reasons too. A lot of people don't have the background that they can't, they can't get through a background check, but housing and um, the length of the process are, are two big barriers. Thank you. One of the ways we're trying to um, avoid some of the issues that we have um, with that long recruiting process is to hire lateral transfers. So a lateral transfer is a police officer who's currently academy trained and working in another civil service police department. Um, we uh, can advertise on our social media pages. We can advertise um, in the you know on the on the town's website. And it offers us a tremendous savings financially to do that. It ends up being approximately $36,000 when you um, consider the cost of uniforms and equipment and the cost to train the person because they don't have the delay of going through a police academy and they have a much shorter field training experience. So um, the laterals are a great option for us. Actually, I'm also a lateral transfer, so <laughs> I'm partial to them. but. Um, so these people have already been trained by another agency. They've already gone to the academy and um, they, they arrive here ready to work. Their training really amounts to learning the geography and our policies. So um, the, the difficulty we have is the chief at the agency that they currently work for has to agree to let them leave. And because of staffing shortages everywhere, it's kind of difficult to get chiefs to let people to leave. In fact, we had an officer um, from a town on the South shore whose chief uh, wouldn't let him go. And when we finally were able to work something out, um, he got offered a specialty position up there and he was able to become a canine officer and he didn't want to leave. So um, but he was on the hook with us for probably six months and we were very excited to have him and it ended up not working because the chief couldn't let go of him because he didn't have the manpower to let him go. But um, we're hopeful that if we can look at some creative options like a signing bonus, which a lot of police departments are uh, implementing now because of the savings that you get when you uh, can hire them, that uh, that might be something that's going to attract people here because if they had a bonus that might be able to offset some of the cost of a move to this area. Yeah, I mean, a shortage of, of police officers to hire in all is, Across all agencies, it's a problem. Um, mm. So it's not possible, but it's it's a uh, even worse here. I think because of the housing, um, the case being so difficult and so expensive. Um, <laughs> this is very difficult to see, but um, one of our other great uh, expenses that we have struggled with a bit is our um, community events and um, we are um, very grateful for the opportunity to serve all of the villages but one of the things that um, you know that like the fire departments don't deal with for example is the fact that we are single-handedly responsible for our presence in all seven villages so when um, there are community when there are village events you know, we want to be able to provide the same level of service to all of the villages, but, and individually, that's great. However, when you look at them collectively, uh, they do put a real financial strain uh, on us and a manpower strain on us because of the overtime situation when you add all these um, bodies to these events. So uh, when we, Anne was 
um, able to total up just last year what some of these events cost us in manpower and in, in overtime. And um, it's just under $40,000 for open streets, the car show, the long table, village days, the 4th of July parades and the Christmas strolls. And individually, none of them would be a, a burden, but the collective burden of all of them um, definitely has an impact on our overtime budget. So it's sort of an interesting way to look at that. And you can see some of these are very heavy in hours. Um, for example, Mother's Day car show is 80 hours of patrol officer time, long table, 80 hours, uh, 4th of July, Village Parade, Kutu, it's 48 hours. Um, it's, they, some of these are very, very labor intensive, uh, manpower intensive. Hmm. We do love them though. Don't get me yeah, wrong. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're part of what makes the town of Barnstable wonderful, but they're, they're expensive sometimes to run. Hmm. So, um, one of the things we do to you know try to make sure that we're accessing alternative funding is to seek out grants. And these are, these are um, some of the grants that we've been utilizing this year. Um, the CDBG grant, the top one is um, monies that we use to pay for our winter community service officers. And those are the two CSOs that um, are out on Main Street from Columbus Day through Memorial Day. And um, we're very grateful to have them. They've been a good presence for us on Main Street. Um, our emergency management performance grant, uh, we just used that money for the purchase of two uh, UHF VHF radios, which are designed to increase communications in the event of a critical incident, whether it was a weather disaster or some other significant critical event um, where we needed interoperability between outside agencies if a state agency came down or federal agency and the police department, because our county radios um, don't have that capacity. So that would give us the opportunity to communicate more effectively. Our um, municipal road safety grant covers all of our traffic enforcement, whether it's um, distracted driving, speeding, our, our um, OUI enforcement, crosswalks, and um, allows our officers to go out on overtime and do those specific targeted enforcement activities. Um, we have two DMH jail diversion grants. The component grant covers a lot of the activities of our community impact unit. Um, and that's the unit that deals a lot with our um, population that suffers from mental health problems or substance use disorder, and also deals a lot with our homeless population. Um, but that particular grant covers a lot of our trainings that are mental health related, whether it's mental health first aid or community crisis intervention team training. And um, they are, the, and the community impact unit is also al um, allowed with those funds to attend a lot of the community uh, dinners and do a lot of their outreach work with, the, with those funds. And the diversion um, co-response grant funds our mental health co-response clinician. And she actually rides with the police officer. Um, she's here Monday through Friday and she goes out and responds to mental health emergencies with the police officer in the cruiser. Um, so she's been a great asset for us. And uh, the goal there is to divert people who are having a mental health crisis or emergency away from both um, jail and also the hospital and try to um, align them with resources in the community. She actually works for Bay Cove and we're able to use those Bay Cove resources uh, and get them better help that they're not gonna get if they're sitting in our lockup. Um, we also have an earmark for $60,000 that is designed to allow us to hire a second clinician. And our goal is to go ahead and do that um, and that clinician would be really performing more follow-up so that our co-response clinician can work on what she needs to work on. And then the second clinician can follow up and provide more attention to the families 
or the people who have been seen by the, the co-response clinician, but they need more intensive follow-up care. Uh, our support and incentive grant covers the cost of our um, salaries, some of our salaries and some overtime for our civilian dispatch staff. And the 911 training grant covers the cost of the continuing education that is mandated for them every year uh, because they have to um, continue their training. And our emergency medical dispatch grant covers the cost of the um, quality assurance that has to be done for the um, and the medical for the uh, emergency medical dispatch and the medical um, director that covers that program. And then our municipal law enforcement grant was used to purchase the over cameras that are going to be used along Main Street. Um, some of our other grant programs uh, that are currently going on, I spoken earlier about the body-worn cameras. This grant uh, will cover the equipment. So all of the cameras themselves, the docking stations, the um, chargers, the everything that's needed for the for the program that's equ physical equipment um, is going to be paid for by this grant. So the other portion, the other $115,000 that is being brought forward is for storage um, and licensing. That is not allowed to be covered by the grant, but all the equipment is. So that this is covering the equipment. Our state 911 regional communication center, um, which has been um, spoken of at town council meetings recently, that was, um, the total will be 850 and that's for engineering and architectural services to um, work on the regional dispatch center, which will likely be located somewhere um, adjacent to the police department here. That will be um, a regional dispatch with Yarmouth and Sandwich. And then the um, federal community or oriented policing grant or COPS grant that $250,000 will be used for partial salaries for two full-time police officers. One is a designated school resource officer and one will be a, um, a traditional patrol officer. And that's where things stand. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Lillian, have a really uh, oh, great overview. Thank you. Chris, I think you had some questions. Um, I think I'm pretty good. Um, what school will that uh, new officer be at? That new SRO will be UEM. What? Say that again. I'm sorry. B U E. Lost the sound. Yeah, we're kind of losing the sound. <clears throat> Can you hear us still? That's weird. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Let me try adjusting something. Stand by. Lillian, while we're waiting, I just want to point out those those last two slides um, yeah. that the police department presented um, illustrate the significant funding we received from state and federal agency to provide public safety services. And without them, we would either lose those services or have to come up with you know general fund tax dollars to to replace it. And so, you know, the police department does a, a fantastic job and has done so for for years. And procuring, you know, these competitive grants to do all of these things that they need to do, um, and they continue to do so. I also want to mention that, um, and I, I can't, I can't, I don't recall if Chief Chalice mentioned this or not, but we are adding two additional sworn officers to um, their authorized strength list, bringing it from 118 to 120, 
with those two officers being paid for with a COPS hiring grant that we were awarded this year. And the funding for those two additional positions will be partially paid for with that grant, which will allow us to phase the cost of those two positions in into the operating budget over a three-year period. Um, so there are a couple of positions being added to the PD this year, um, increasing their authorized strength list with minimal impact to the operating budget this year um, as a result of that grant. But that the grant will phase out over a period of time and we'll migrate that cost onto the operating budget. How long will the public serv uh, safety services grant last? You were That's a three year grant, but we anticipated using those funds over the course of two years to cover those positions. How's the audio quality? Is it better? Much better. Theo's good now, yes. So just one more time, what school was that new officer for? It'd be, it'd be, the person would be going to Barstool United Elementary, BUES. Okay, yes, excellent, thank you. Um, Chief, I'm curious to know of your 118 sworn staff, how many, how many women and how many minorities in the 118? I believe we're at nine women's and um, minority it's I have to we have it you know it's it's difficult because people identify in a particular uh, way with the town so I I guess I'd probably say five or six five or minority. six minority yeah and do you feel, do you feel, and I know this is diversity, equity, inclusion, it's a sort of a hot button, but do you, do you feel that that percentage of women and, and minorities is sufficient? Or are you focused on recruiting, for example, more women in the future? It would be wonderful to be able to hire a more, you know, diverse group, you know, men and women. Um, however, one of the um, issues with civil service is you get a list of candidates that is um, pretty established by score and by um, status. So the first group you get are children, uh, officers who were killed or injured in the line of duty. And then the next group is disabled veterans who are residents and then veterans who are residents and then disabled veterans who are non-residents and then veterans who are non-residents. And then you get the general population. So um, because of that, and because of the number of women who are veterans, you tend not to see a lot of women at the top of the list. Yeah. Uh, and that, and if you if you request a special certification, you can request women, or you can request EMTs, or you can request um, bilingual. You you know you can make those requests. You actually have to um, put forth reasons why you feel that your community, um, not reasons why you need them, but sort of reasons why your community is um, deficient in those areas. So it's not, um, it's almost like you have to give, it's like when you don't hire somebody, you're not saying the reasons why you hired this good candidate. You have to give the reasons why you didn't hire the other candidate. So you're, you're having to give negative information instead of positive information. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of communities don't end up doing that because you're not stating the reasons why Barnstable would benefit from doing this. You're saying why Barnstable's bad because you don't have these people in your ranks. So a lot of communities don't end up requesting those special certifications just because yeah. of the reason behind why you have to list the information. Okay, and just a couple of follow-up questions. You mentioned veterans and, and, and so forth. Those people in those categories have, they are to be recruited from first under the civil service rules? 
Yes, they get preference for hiring. Uh huh. Okay. And one last question on civil service. When do you expect the, the, the police department to be out from under the civil service rules? How long will the, the process take for the town to extricate itself from, from this uh, process? I'm not sure how long it will take. I think um, there's a, I believe that the understanding now from town legal is that we go out the way we came in, which would mean that it isn't very complicated to come out on paper. However, before we come out, there needs to be an extensive amount of work done to establish how we would do a hiring process, how we would deal with promotions and what kind of a disciplinary process would be in place so that all of that is established before we would uh, come out. Because once you're out, we don't want it to be like a chaotic Lord of the Flies situation. We want to have every we want to have everything built so that when we come out, we have an orderly transition out. Uh, so I, I don't know that the removal from civil service itself will be that long, but there are other communities who have struggled for a very long time to get out, and sometimes it's well over a year. Okay, thank you. How many recruits do we have in the pipeline right now? We have uh, one we, that is scheduled to start an academy in August. And then we have two currently in the academy and we have one in field training. <laughs> so we are um, very low uh, in our numbers. They're all fabulous, um, excellent candidates. The one that's supposed to start the academy in August is a former community service officer for us, but um, we're at a point right now where we either have to advertise for laterals right away, or we're gonna have to hire, start another um, hiring process through traditional civil service means and try to get um, officers into probably a November academy. And they're not road ready for a year, roughly after that. So are you using the existing officers over time to cover the all of the shifts? Yeah, uh, yes. I mean, it's managed. I, I think we try to manage yeah. that over time as best we can. Uh -huh. You know, if a supervisor takes a look at the shift and can determine that they, you know, can, you know, it's not, it seems like it's going to be not as busy a night. They might be able to bring in uh, one less person, but if it looks like it's a Saturday night in the summertime, um, they have to have, um, you know, they have to have adequate staff. As the chief said, it's a it's similar to a hospital. You have to have enough people on the shift to, to be able to manage what's going on on that shift. And there is no situation where you can have, you know, you can bring in, you can do without them. Um, so it's, um, uh, it's really up to the, the shift lieutenants and sergeants to, to kind of determine what they need for that shift, but I, they do manage it as best they can. Yeah. Anybody have any other questions or comments? Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Chief, could you just talk a little bit? Uh, for the committee's benefit about the um, timing and the location of academies when they occur and where they take place, because it is another obstacle, I think, to our hiring is that, you know, we have to get seats in these academies in order to um, get officers trained. Sure. Uh, generally, we try to use Plymouth because it's the closest for us. Um, and Plymouth has been traditionally running two academies a year, one in the late summer and one in February. Um, historically, that has been somewhat of a problem when a hiring list is brand new because, as I said, the test is offered in March and civil service releases the list of scores in July. And because of the 
background process that we do, we never have anybody ready for that late summer or September Plymouth Academy. So that means we end up sending people to the February Academy um, after a brand new list comes out. So we generally can't send anybody to that August or September Academy until the list is on its, we're on a second or third run through a hiring list. Um, the other uh, police academies are far away. They are um, up in, they're Randolph. Um, there's one in New Braintree. They're in Lynn. Um, they're just not feasible for people who are living on the Cape for um, daytime you know, commute. Generally, we like because of the oversight that we need to have of people and the fact that they're driving a marked Barnstable cruiser, we have them come here in the morning and check in and then they get their gear and their cruiser and they drive together as a group to Plymouth. But if they are, just as an example, we had one recruit who lived in Braintree. So he would drive from Braintree to Barnstable in the morning and then drive back to the academy in Plymouth. Um, if that recruit had to go to Lynn, to the academy or Randolph, um, he would have had to have driven from Braintree to Barnstable, back up to the North Shore, and then back from the North Shore all the way back to Barnstable to drop the car off and then back to Braintree. And when you add that into the demands of their day, um, when they have to be in formation, you know, at 6.30 or 7 in the morning, um, and they have a bunch of homework to do, including making sure that their uniforms are impeccable, it just becomes overly burdensome on them. And as an agency, it's just, we're not setting them up for success. So uh, we are very limited in where we can send them. Fortunately, um, the state wanted to look into opening a, an academy on the Cape. Unfortunately, they decided on Falmouth. So um, Falmouth is slated to open their own academy, which is not close to us. It's about a 45 minute drive, 40 minute drive from here to where the location is in, in Falmouth. Um, so again, Plymouth is closer, but um, Falmouth will be having an academy. So. The goal is to have Falmouth run an academy in October and Plymouth to continue to run those two academies in the fall and, I mean, in the late summer and the winter. And that will hopefully give us that additional option. And the Cape Academy is supposed to be primarily used for Cape towns. So we should be able to secure seats for people which will hopefully improve um, our odds of getting people in, into a class. Um, one of the other challenges is that a lot of South Coast police departments like to use the Plymouth Academy because they don't wanna send everybody up to the North Shore either. And there just really aren't a lot of um, easy locations for people coming from New Bedford and Fall River. So, and they send 10 and 12 people at a time. They tend to wanna to send a big pack yeah and have the academy weed them out, whereas we would much rather weed our people out first and send five or six people to the academy. They'll send a dozen and have seven or eight graduate and they don't care. So they take the seats and then nobody else can have them. Chief, is the municipal academy that uh, Chief Kynes was running, is that defunct? The Cape Academy is, mm -hmm. is non-existent. And so that is what's gonna be technically opening in Falmouth. Okay. They may run two a year. I'm just not, um, I'm not familiar enough with the dates, but I know their plan is to run their first one. It's supposed to be in October. I believe now they're thinking sometime closer to November. I believe they're breaking ground in July this year. So, but it's not a very convenient location for us or for, you know, any of the lower Cape police departments. We were hoping for something more central on the Cape. It didn't work out. Thank you. Does any do do any of the members or have any other questions of the uh, of the chief and Anne? Thank you. 
thank you very much. We appreciate your coming and answering all our questions. Thank you. Thank you for your thank time. You. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes before the school arrives. So, Chuck, if you would like to talk about the uh, this, your schedule for the operating budget the drafts and meetings. Yeah, so uh, I don't have my calendar right in front of me, but um, I'm hoping uh, people who uh, are on the uh, operating budget subcommittee can get me their first drafts by this Friday, I think is what we said. Uh, at the latest, um, I will work on putting those together over the weekend, uh, get them out uh, to the full committee before Monday's meeting. We can uh, talk through kind of format, flow, and content. Um, I think uh, Mark has set up two um, additional meetings, uh, maybe like May 1st and 8th or something like that, Mark, um, in case yeah, we need them at the subcommittee. Um, yeah, I, I sent those out today, Chuck, and just for the benefit of the group, um, those two meetings on the May 1st and May 8th were for the operating budget subcommittee. Right. Uh, but of course, any members invited to join us if, you, if you'd like. So I, I anticipate we'll need the one on the first um, based on the uh, comments and feedback that we get on Monday. Um, and the eighth is up in the air, or it could be that wherever Monday's conversation leads, we skip the first and keep the eighth. But the, the goal is we need to have the report finalized and ready for submission, if I understand it, by May 13th. Um, right. And so that that's kind of the, the drop dead date to make sure we have everything together. So, um, Mark, did I understand you to say that there's another full CFAC meeting next Monday? No, it's the operating no. uh, operating budget subcommittee, but everybody, all of CFAC is invited. Yes, right. But there is no May twenty nine, April 29th meeting. No. Okay. Not Check for it. full CFAC, right. Okay, yes. thank you. So Chuck, you're thinking maybe um, we'll have a um, CFAC full committee review of the operating budget the week of the six? Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Do any members of the subcommittee have any questions? No, no questions. I'll get you my draft uh, ASAP, Chuck. Good. Thank you. And you, and you have all of the financials on it, Chris? Um, I believe so. If not, I'll reach out to Mark. So you've got the police and the DPW? I should, yep. Okay. Thank you. Well, while we're waiting for the schools, we can have um, a report from members. Um, I know that Jim and Chris and I all went to the water tour over the weekend. So if you'd like to tell us how, what your experience was like and about the filtration facility. You're on mute, Jim. I was just going to ask you if you wanted to go first. <laughs> oh, um, well, I found it very informative. I thought it was a, a great walkthrough and uh, Hans and Sam were very knowledgeable about everything. And I, I found it very productive and informative. I, I mean, it was an amazing complex. I had no idea. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed the tour. And, uh, you know, they're very dedicated people. Uh, the it's run by a board, the five-person board um, that is very much engaged, and they have uh, certainly have their finger on the pulse of water quality in not only Hyannis but the town of Barnstable. And, um, yeah, gave me greater understanding of their need for the straightway filtration plant that they have in the CIP this year. So. 
Well, I thought that they, um, this particular plant that we, we visited um, gets rid of the PFAS, so the PFAS existence is negligible. It's really, it's really highly, it's really state of the art. It was very, very impressive. Well, my other takeaway was I asked Hans, I said, does he drink bottled or tap water? And uh, he said he drinks tap water. So uh, I brought that message back home. <laughs> We're drinking tap water. <laughs> Did you see all the different water and different levels of water dripping yeah. into dripping into uh, cups? Yeah. At, at different stages of purification. All right, Hector, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> no, with iodine, without iodine. <laughs> Took the iron and magnesium out of this one. Where, um, where, what, what, what plant did you tour? What's the name of it, Lillian? And where is it located? It's the one off of Old Yarmouth Road. Okay. You know, near the near the airport. Okay. Yeah. So if you go up, if you hang it, if you hang a left, going on Willow. Yeah. Toward Yarmouth, yeah, a couple of hundred yards up, you bear right, and you just keep on going. Okay, but it's really—I it, it, thought it was really worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. If I wanted to take the tour, who would I contact? Uh Sam um, Sam Wilson. Oh, that's right. Sam would do it. Yeah. Yeah. Sam Wilson is the contact person. Okay. Yeah. I may do. I may do that. That sounds interesting. Oh, it's I'm supposed to go on. Uh, I'm supposed to go on Sunday morning, Hector, but uh, they have one set up for, I think, Sunday at nine. So uh, just FYI. Okay, that's great. Maybe I'll see you there, Chuck. Yeah. And Hans knows everything going on. I mean, he's really an expert and so dedicated. And they yeah, serve that, that whole, that whole wow. customer. There's 7,000 customers, and they're all serviced through an operation and maintenance contract. Yeah. So only two employees dedicated to the water supply. Hans and an administrative assistant, and everything else is outsourced. Yeah. So, Tom, if you have a chance and have yeah, the. That sounds like it'd be a blast. Yeah. I we recommend it. I'll give you. I know I've got it here. It's Samuel B. Samuel period B period Wilson at gmail dot com, and all of it is lowercase. Samuel.b.wilson at gmail.com. Right. Great. Thank you. That's, yeah. that's super. You're I'll, welcome. I'll email him. I think some people just joined us. Yeah. No? The, the superintendent just there we joined go. us. And I don't know if Chris Dwelly is here yet. Chris has just joined us. So we're good. Uh -huh. Any other comments about the water filtration plant before we uh, hear from the schools on their budget? Okay, then. Uh, we welcome um, Sarah Ahern and um, Chris Dwelly. And we know that you've been already busy and we, we really appreciate your taking the time to come by and um, tell us about your, your, operating, your proposed operating budget. Thank you. Um, and thank you for being understanding of our uh, various time commitments uh, that we have. Um, but we did want to be responsive to your uh, invitation and appreciate you having us on here at the seven o'clock time frame uh, well, to we share know our budget. How, we, know how, we know how packed your schedule is. We thank you. I have um, a presentation. It's very brief, but I thought that that might help um, ground where we are in terms of the school department budget. So if I don't know if I've got the ability to share my screen. 
You should be all set, Sarah. Okay, great. You just... Uh... Yeah. All right. Can you see my screen or is it just not yet? Not yet. Okay. So now I think we... we should be able to yeah, see it. Oh. Yep. Okay. Um, so the school committee approved uh, the school department's budget uh, at their April 3rd meeting. And this is a um, modified tweaked slightly presentation for you uh, this evening to go over the major highlights um, from the budget. The um, budget starts with budget assumptions um, based on uh, information from the town and the revenue sharing allocation. Um, we had worked with um, Mark Milne uh, around a 5% increase uh, around the revenue share um, for a projected revised uh, allocation as seen here uh, around $87 million. Um, this was uh, kind of especially noteworthy this year. You'll recall last year that the district had received a pretty substantial increase in its chapter 70 money uh, as part oh. of the Student Opportunity Act. And this year due to um, what seems to be largely inflationary factors, um, the increase that we had expected, we had expected uh, something on the order of a $3 million increase or higher um, was not realized um, from, from the state, uh, despite having all of the same uh, needs uh, and then some with respect to, uh, with respect to students. Uh, and so appreciate working with the town uh, to support that 5% increase um, despite some uh, less than favorable Chapter 70 monies coming in. Um, the House has come out with its budget and the Senate will come out with their budget and they are um, doing a little bit better um, by way of school uh, funding uh, in terms of the minimum aid per pupil has increased. Um, but there is an advocacy opportunity that I um, try to remind our um, uh, interested citizens, there's an advocacy opportunity with the state legislators uh, to potentially change the way the state funds um, related to inflation. Uh, there are some additional uh, important uh, aspects here that I would point your attention to. Um, one is that we are uh, seeing the expiration of our ESSER funds. This is uh, coronavirus pandemic relief funding that uh, occurred over three fiscal years, and the expiration of that is coming this September. Um, like many districts, um, we are uh, in the in the um, service industry with people, and uh, so much of our budgets uh, do depend upon personnel. So not all of our ESSER funds were going towards personnel, but we do have some real critical key um, personnel uh, that we're seeking to retain through um, through FY twenty five's uh, operating budget. So we had to account for that. Um, of course, we have uh, an expected budget driver of an increase in salary and wages. Um, we are uh, expecting an increase in uh, tuition and transportation related to mandated services for students on IEPs. And, um, you know, sometimes some years are more favorable than others. Um, last year, we did not see a huge increase, and that was very helpful to the budget. Uh, but this year, we're seeing more of an increase um, some of which will be returned to us uh, in the form of circuit breaker reimbursement the year after. We have inflationary pressures uh, in things like software, materials, and utilities. Um, we have uh, decreased our funding for building-based subs, but we need to incorporate building-based substitutes into the budget. And we are uh, looking to supplement the appropriation with money from the school savings account uh, in a uh, step down fashion um, in order to incorporate ESSER positions into the operating budget. So this year, um, proposing 2.4 million, but over the next three years, um, pair that back uh, to be 75% of the ESSER costs, then 50%, then 25% as we work to incorporate positions into the operating budget. 
In terms of um, the superintendent's priorities and making recommendations to the school committee, um, really want to support the goals of our district improvement plan. Um, we need to be sure that we're attending to a diverse set of student needs. As I said, those needs continue to increase and aren't going away. Um, we're focusing on equitable allocation of resources uh, across the district, uh, making sure that uh, we're keeping in mind um, how we're staffing uh, each of our buildings and how we're taking care of each of our buildings as well um, through space and facility studies. Um, we're looking to be more efficient and effective, and I'll speak to some examples of that, making sure that um, we are uh, fiscally prudent. We continue to focus on our facilities and plan for our space needs. Um, but this is all within a backdrop of what we know uh, needed to be conservative in terms of our budget development with ESSER's expiration. And there are some um, structural uh, things that uh, Chris and I have built in to create some more sustainability and predictability and transparency in reporting. We ask our sites to submit priorities. Um, I did ask them also to consider reallocation of resources, uh, knowing that this was going to be a tight budget year. Um, so uh, to be sure that not only were they asking for new things that they need, new initiatives, but also um, possible ways to support that and to fund it. Um, many of the major themes uh, included, first and foremost, retaining uh, any positions that were funded through those ESSER dollars. Um, those included uh, counselors, uh, paraprofessionals, um, like PCAs, personal care assistants, uh, and we have several teaching positions um, I'll detail in a moment. Continuing to support our English language learners with family liaisons and translation services, as well as teachers and paraprofessionals, and then meeting uh, special education mandates uh, through teachers, paras, and some leadership. In terms of how this all um, factors out um, between the uh, proposed uh, revenue sharing uh, and appropriation at 5%, which is towards uh, the bottom, um, and the inclusion of 2.4 million from the school savings account, um, the school department's uh, approved budget, it was approved by the school committee, um, is, can you see my cursor, my little arrow? Yep. Yeah. Um, the um, approved budget uh, that was approved by the school committee um, sums to $89,375,000 uh, and, and $780,000. It's roughly a $6.5 million increase or 7.92%. Chris, is there anything that you would add related to this slide? In terms of funding sources, this is a breakdown of funding sources uh, in the past several fiscal years. Um, we have not spent um, savings money in the past couple of years to offset the budget, uh, although we had done so between FY19 and FY22. Uh, so you'll see in FY25 that um, projection, uh, again, to offset uh, ESSER increase, increases. Um, consistent with recent years, proposing uh, to offset some of the expenses with 750,000 from school choice, um, $1.8 million in circuit breaker, which is um, money that we received this year for um, the uh, higher special education costs uh, in the district, and then the 86.9 million from the general fund. In terms of this um, accepted budget, uh, 28.5 positions uh, funded with ESSER dollars are proposed to be retained. This is not all of the ESSER positions. We did carefully pick and choose which ones to keep, um, but they really include um, some mandated services uh, for uh, instruction for students. Uh, we've got teachers and paraprofessionals and counselors um, interventionists to help work on um, addressing skill gaps and um, admin assistance is AA um, to help support um, some of our additional um, needs in the district. So uh, that is a total of 28 and a half positions, um, but there are some, uh, again, that we did not uh, continue to move forward with um, 
very purposefully. And then uh, there are uh, some additional investments, um, again, carefully selected and carefully chosen um, and discussed with the school committee, many of which fall in line with mandated services. Um, so you'll see uh, two special education teachers, um, four PCAs or paraprofessionals, uh, a speech and language pathologist assistant, um, these are all uh, related to mandated services for students on IEPs. Uh, we have uh, some specialists uh, that are you know, kind of uh, being adjusted in the district. There are some offsets uh, to support these that I'll talk about in a moment, but it is uh, to improve and address and make more efficient the scheduling of specialists at Hyannis West and BCIS. Uh, a big priority that we're really excited about and proud uh, to be recognized with is uh, we are the first district in um, this region and one of only 16 schools to be accepted to the Coast Guard's JROTC program. Um, the Coast Guard does fund um, a huge amount of being able to support this program. Um, so there are some offsets in terms of reimbursements from them for staffing costs, but we have uh, budgeted about $100,000 in order to open up the JROTC program, which we think will be a really big um, draw uh, in, in Barnstable. We have um, a teacher for uh, mandated special education services at the high school proposed as our population of students from 18 to 22 continues to expand. Uh, an EL teacher at the high school, uh, again, as we see more EL students, and we just had the Department of Education reviewing our EL program, and they do have some um, required actions for us to take in order to um, better meet students' needs. And um, also that includes some uh, paraprofessionals uh, to help support them. We have um, a very uh, active and thriving um, community mentor program where we have 10 mentors um, spending time in our schools, uh, working with students uh, and overall uh, affecting the climate and culture. Um, we are proposing uh, and have the school committee's approval to include it in our operating budget. Um, we will in the future um, pursue grant funding uh, to see if we can offset that in the future. We have um, extended school year uh, is a mandated service for many of our students, not all of course, but many of our students are entitled to summer services and there is an inc expected increased cost uh, to that mandated, uh, that mandated service. Uh, we are required to translate uh, and have interpretation for our documents and meetings. Uh, and we always, um, we always, um, I shouldn't say always, but we have a need to um, increase uh, expenses there, although we are looking for ways to make our communications more streamlined, more effective, and more efficient. Um, and uh, we're seeking some strategic long-term solutions, including uh, the state using a different vendor that the state approves. Um, we have... Um, support from the school committee to increase the athletic department's budget based on uh, that thriving program. Um, we do also have um, an increase that's been approved, uh, an incremental increase to athletic fees to help to offset the increased expenses in the athletic department. We uh, have a very thriving uh, and important after school program for students and need to continue to support after school transportation. Um, that does have an increased cost uh, expected for next year. And um, we do also have an incremental increase to our transportation fees to help offset uh, the increased cost of transportation uh, that is occurring. Um, we need to make sure that we're um, paying attention to and refreshing our technology. And so there is a um, device lease um, and purchase um, increase from FY24. Um, paying attention to our facilities needs, increasing uh, the expense in terms of contracted services by 200,000. Um, that's the amount that's been approved, but the requested amount was higher. 
Uh, we not only do we need to pay attention to student devices, which was the 67,000, um, we also need to make sure that our staff have what they need to do their jobs. Um, and so we're moving towards a model um, where we will lease devices for four years. Um, and that does come at something of a cost savings to the district. Um, again, trying to stretch our dollars as, as best we can. Um, we would love to add more custodians to our um, fleet. Um, we did add one in FY24, and we are looking to add another one for FY25. Uh, these floating custodial positions uh, we uh, anticipate will help save uh, some money in terms of overtime. Uh, so that will be kind of a good investment for us to be making. Um, we are uh, taking a social worker position and making it into a BCBA. Um, so it does come as a change to the budget, but there is an offset here uh, that I'll kind of detail a little bit more later on. And then um, we have um, a curriculum review. We are looking to implement a comprehensive curriculum review in each curriculum area over the next several years. We just had a very successful one with early literacy and modeling uh, the process after that, we'll make sure that we're um, really current in all of our content areas. In order to deliver a balanced budget, which is what we have done, um, we've had to look at offsets and reallocations. Um, and so uh, I've got a summary slide here uh, related to those offsets and reallocations. Uh, I'm blanking on the total uh, dollar value that this would represent uh, in the current moment, um, but you can see that it's um, over two million uh, in order to to balance the budget. We are anticipating, like I said, reimbursement from the Coast Guard for fifty percent of the personnel costs. Um, we um, the school committee approved additional savings uh, to support the athletic department budget increase, but like I had noted, we did also um, incrementally increase some of those athletic fees. Uh, we are shifting some money in the assistant superintendent's office to support the curriculum review from professional development. Um, it really kind of coincides uh, with what we're looking to do. We asked all of our sites, um, based on spending in the March timeframe, we asked all of our sites to think critically about uh, expenditures and uh, reduce expenses by 5%. That was a tough task to do. Uh, and I don't think we quite hit the 5% mark, but we were able to trim a little bit uh, to the tune of 260,000. Um, the biggest area uh, of any school district's budget is going to be in salary and salaries uh, for personnel. Uh, and so uh, the biggest area where we created some um, budget reallocations is in staffing positions, um, 23.8 to be exact. Uh, we looked at all of our vacancies first because we are having difficulty staffing some of our positions. Uh, two of those vacancies are here as the Medicaid coordinator and an administrative assistant for our ELL department. Um, and then 23.1 um, positions were critically examined um, in the district in order to uh, deliver this balanced budget. Um, we looked first at retirements and resignations um, and our goal was to maintain class sizes within contractual requirements, um, which we've done. There were some places where um, we were able to um, reduce some classroom teaching positions due to um, some small enrollment decreases that we've experienced recently. Um, but what I will say is that getting to the bottom line was a pretty difficult task uh, at the end of the day. And, um, and I, I do worry a little bit um, about FY26 and FY27, and um, it's a very active conversation that we're having uh, again about kind of creating a, a more sustainable, sustainable budget. So we had seven vacancies and four retirements that we were able to absorb um, positions with due to attrition. Uh, and the 23.1 positions are detailed here uh, for you. And I can um, maybe through Chris uh, send the slides to Mark Milne who can share this with you. So you have it as a, a reference point. Um, the 
this presentation is on our website from April 3rd uh, and has all of the same information that was shared with the school committee. Um, but we have looked at um, reallocating uh, the social worker position for the BCBA. Uh, these two classroom teachers were ESSER funded positions that covered um, a bubble of enrollment at the two schools, um, but we're um, not going to continue forward with those. Um, we've had uh, a vacancy at this, uh, I'm sorry, that's not a vacancy. Um, we um, are reallocating a teaching assistant. Uh, we have a vacancy in the PBL coach at BCIS. The tech teacher, um, I did talk about specialists that were sort of tweaked and changed. Um, this was one of the reallocations from that principal uh, related to a technology teacher. Um, we had four classroom teachers at BUES. Um, again, we're able to maintain class sizes. Um, the class sizes here will go from something around 18 or 19 students to about 21 or 22 students per, per classroom. Um, so we uh, reallocated there. Uh, we had a vacancy in this teaching assistant position. Uh, the library assistant at Hyannis West was reduced um, from uh, point by point three uh, to half time. Uh, we had um, we anticipate um, reducing a special education teacher at BIS, but having plenty of vacancies elsewhere in the district so that we can um, provide uh, somebody with a with a role and transfer them into a different role uh, in a different school. Um, the PBL specialist uh, at BIS is going to be strictly teaching and not coaching. So that is a change for next year. Um, we have three uh, teachers at the high school. Um, again, really look, the principal really looked carefully at class sizes and, um, and identified uh, teachers in these three departments. Um, we will be able to maintain class sizes within contractual requirements um, here. Uh, we had vacancies in our alternative learning program, uh, so reallocated two positions from there. We had a vacant counselor position at the high school um, proposed uh, to the school committee to reallocate that. Um, we are um, reallocating one of our math coaches. Um, we have a vacancy in our audiovisual um, tech, um, and we are doing more contracted services for tech requirements. So we've included that position. Um, we anticipate a savings by um, contracting out uh, our legal services versus having an in-house attorney. And um, the director of teaching and learning um, is a proposed reallocation, but actually at this point, an approved reallocation for a total of 23.1. The next two slides uh, detail the um, budget by cost center. We have 18 cost centers. And um, again, that bottom line is an increase of just under 8%. And by DESI function um, denoted here. Chris, is there anything that you would want to add about uh, any of these? I don't. Did a great job covering everything. OK. Um, so we'd be happy to um, answer any questions or take your comments um, related to what is now the uh, school committee's approved budget for FY25. So I'll, just, I'll start <laughs> off. I wanted to, I'd, have there been any changes in the enrollment of ED and ELL students? Um, so I'd have to, um, I'd have to pull up um, I'd have to pull up a slide. Both of those um, subgroups are increasing slightly. Um, not we we're not seeing the same dramatic increase that we've seen over the past couple of years, but there is right. an increase in the number of students on IEPs and an increase um, in ELL students. And then I think you asked about economically disadvantaged as well. And we saw yeah, a de we saw a decrease in um, the percentage of students who are um, identified as economically disadvantaged. Um, some of that might be a result of um, identification through MassHealth, 
Um, so I'm a little bit concerned that uh, the state didn't fully recognize everybody that should be uh, qualifying as economically disadvantaged, but um, there was a small decrease there that was seen. I see. Yeah, well, there was a dramatic increase in the ELL between 22 and 23, and I just wondered what other kind of changes are. How many how many students are categorized as both ED and ELL? Because I know we get a we get a special um, added amount, incremental amount if they if they're in both categories. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't have that, but Chris and I I may be crossing fiscal years. Um, it may be FY twenty four that uh, that that was quantified in the budget book. Um, but you may have that number uh, handy. We don't have the we don't have it broken down about uh, multiple categories, but I can pull it up from the state and send the link over to Mark, and he can share with the with the committee. That, that would be great. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Good evening. Um, a, a number of questions. Um, you talked about a two point, um, two point four percent savings. What, what, where do you get that amount? Um, what generates that saving? Sure. Um, Chris, do you want to take this? It was two point four million in savings. Um, and I'll have Chris go over some of the the details there. Sure, uh, it's two primary ways. One uh, are any operating budget funds that go unspent at the uh, end of the fiscal year. So for instance, if we have uh, vacancies in our positions that we don't fill for the year, uh, those monies um, go back into the school savings account. Um, and then the other area um, that Mark could actually expand upon uh, if he wanted to, um, was uh, our excess revenue or um, additional revenue beyond um, what, what's been estimated um, by him in the finance department. So this is what you estimate to be your savings at the end of 24? Nope, the $2.4 oh. million is what we're using from the current uh, school savings. Oh, okay. Yep. Thank you. So, um, and, and you're using that for FY24? Five. 25. Yep. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, every year you receive the Chapter 78. Uh, how is it paid back? It, it just reduces the overall uh, amount of the school's budget. So there is no payback to the state? There's no, no, there's no payback, no. No, okay. All right. Um, what is the highest cost except um, administration in your operating budget? Our highest costs are our salaries, as, uh, as Sarah mentioned. Uh, I think it's to the tune of 82% of our budget. Uh, our mm -hmm. next largest drivers are our special education costs, primarily for out-of-district tuition um, and transportation. Okay. Um, Sarah talked about FY26 and FY27 being something that causes her to worry. Uh, what are those factors? We're going to um, continue to work on incorporating what had, we, we faced a little bit of a fiscal cliff here with ESSER funds. Um, and so incorporating ESSER positions into the operating budget, we don't want to rely on 2.4 million of school savings every year. We're going to drain our savings account. Um, it does not get replenished at that rate. So uh, we are going to sort of wean ourselves off of um, supplementing the budget with the savings account. So that is one factor that has me worried about the future. And then um, I'm concerned about um, what's been happening at the state level with in terms of uh, their support of Chapter 70 
And um, again, I'd point to some advocacy opportunities um, for them to fund at the actual inflation rate. Um, they cap it at four and a half percent. And um, so the past couple of years when inflation was seven and eight percent, they capped their funding at four and a half percent. And now inflation is being um, estimated as 1.3 percent. And so the Chapter 70 monies uh, kind of uh, followed suit. Um, so I think that um, the state's support has been a little unpredictable and uh, that those two factors are, are, are on my mind. And I guess I would say, I'm sorry if I could just jump in and add one other piece. Um, I know through the capital process, we talked about our facilities um, conditions assessment and uh, you know we continue to have uh, some unmet needs related to our buildings. And so there are some things that I think we'd really like to invest in and need to invest in. Um, and there's just a lot of competing demands. So that's one of the things that caused you to worry the, in, the investments in the buildings. Yeah, I think um, I, I think that um, we've we've got some some needs to invest in the buildings. We are pr really appreciative of um, the proposal going forward to the town council related to several projects to the tune of I think close to ten million dollars um, for the school department. Um, but in terms of our operating budget, um, you know, we're, we're, um, we're pretty lean, uh, in, in, in our support of that department. Okay. Would you say, uh, or I, I think I want to ask the question in another way, uh, if you were given the option, uh, mandatory option, you, you wouldn't have a choice to cut any of the services that you have. Um, which ones would you cut right away? Uh, or, or what would you do if you if someone said, okay, you know, we're going to reduce your budget by two million, what would you cut? So I would try to cut um, in areas that are farthest away from the students. Um, and I think you have seen a little bit of uh, my approach with respect to looking at vacancies, looking at retirements, um, making sure that we're keeping um, our class sizes reasonable, but being efficient too with class sizes um, to try to really minimize the impact of having to make any cut on any particular department or program. Um, that would be the the last thing that I would want to do is to have to start reducing services of specific programs. Um, I think we have a great breadth and variety to offer here and um, really being able to attend to a lot of different student needs and student interests. So I would my, the, the last thing that I would want to do is sort of wipe out an entire uh, an entire program. Um, and I'll just, I'm not picking on music for any particular reason, but you know, you see in some districts, music might come up um, where you're, that would be the last thing that I would want to do is have to have to eliminate a particular program. I'm, I think that the allocations that we did this year, um, uh, you know, took advantage of, of certain, certain opportunities like the retirements and, and some class size pieces. Um, but I do worry about any, any situation where I have to um, cut deeper than that. Okay. My, uh, my take on music is that there are children who will never be interested in school, except music makes the whole difference for them because they actually learn something that they're interested in. And then after that, um, numbers make sense or um, patterns make sense or, you know, they go on to achieving. So no, music is not one of the things. But let's say you, you really had to cut something. Where would that cut come from? Uh, you're not going to cut the services or you're not going to cut teachers or so, but what, what, what is it that you absolutely would do? Um, I think it's hard in hypotheticals in any particular year. I think there's 23.1 or 23.8 positions, um, you know, kind of in the FY25 budget um, that sort of demonstrate across the board um, 
it's, it involves teachers, it involves counselors, it involves paraprofessionals, it involves administrators. So not focusing in on any one particular area, but seeing you know enterprise wide uh, where are some um, some things that we can pare back. Okay. Um, okay. My other question is. Does the school have a grant writer that looks for money as outside of um, Chapter 70 or what the town would offer? Yes, we have an amazing grant manager. Her name is Jackie Gillis. And um, I will say this is my second year in the district. Um, so I still feel like I bring a little bit of an outsider's perspective. Um, the work that she does uh, to bring in additional revenue is really outstanding. Um, Chris can probably quantify it, um, but there is a tremendous amount of uh, grant money that comes into the district, um, and, and Jackie does a phenomenal job. Okay. Um, another How question. much are those grants? I'll, I'll send you over the exact um, dollar amount. I just well, I don't know if I figure out yeah. the costs. Yeah. Uh, and are they they're going to be funding specific things? So are you looking for specific areas that you're doing the grants for, or is it just general um, to cover your general costs? Um, yeah, the the grants typically are written specifically. So there is a grant that I have in mind for the community mentors. It's not available until next fall. So we had to include that in our in our budget. But when the grant if if and when the grant comes up, it's actually from the D Department of Public Health related to um, school safety. Um, I would use that as an opportunity to apply for that grant. Um, to help support the continued uh, investment in that program. Um, but yeah, they do tend to be, you know, sort of earmarked for specific things. Some are more general. The entitlements um, might be uh, applied a little bit more generally. We have money um, for special education, for example, um, through an entitlement grant. Um, but we, we do have, um, you know, the, the grants do tend to be pretty specific and we pick and choose. Sometimes the um, grant's not a good fit and we don't want to necessarily um, put put a lot of, it, it does take a lot of work to implement the grants as well. Um, so we do um, we do judiciously um, decide which, what's going to be a good fit, but Barnstable does a tremendous job bringing in grant monies. Okay. Uh, OPEB, um, what kind of return do you get on that? Uh, in your investments for retirement. Um, can you maybe re like state that so again? You have the investment, the the retirement for OPEB, which you're. I think you. I'm not sure about all of this, but you put it in an account um, for retirement for when people retire. Um, do you earn investments on that? And how do you use those investments? Um, I think I would yeah. look to somebody from the finance department to respond to that. It's more of a town finance piece. Um, uh, with I, the... I'll take that question, Sarah. So yeah, Jackie, the um, other post-employment benefits trust fund that the town has um, is invested with Rockland Trust. Um, I believe it has like a 60-40 equity fixed income um, investment mix to it and any investment income that that trust earns stays with that trust as we try to build the assets um, to address that unfunded liability. Okay, so it goes back into the trust almost like retained earnings or something it's, like that? It's part of the trust, yes. It's, a, it's an investment vehicle that stay, any income that's earned stays with the trust. Does it offset the costs that you have to put into the trusts um, every year? Those, those. Um, no, it, it just adds to the asset valuation of the trust. We appropriate money into that trust every year, and the investment earnings that it, it that it creates stays with that trust as well. And you know the value right now with the appropriations and investment income that we've earned over the past few years has brought the value of that trust up to about ten million dollars. But our unfunded liability is 100 million. So um, we're building, again, an investment to eventually meet that unfunded liability. 
Okay, all right, last question. Um, would you consider combining any of the needs of the, the students or, or the, the, the teachers or your special services? Um, so you probably have um, intermediate schools or the high school, and would you con consider combining them perhaps on the one roof or um, instead of having, let's say 10 teachers at one school, then you would have, um, swing teachers, that, that's my terminology for them, like swing teachers, which you would, you know, disseminate to other schools in order to cut the cost of, of salaries? Um, so that's a great question. Um, and I think it speaks to that bullet that I had talked about in terms of efficient uh, and effective systems and equity across buildings. We are looking to have more staff shared across school buildings. Um, there is a loss potentially with um, transportation, but if people are spending different days in different buildings, um, we're, I think, able to run a little bit more effectively and a little bit more efficiently um, by sort of maximizing um, the staff uh, across the district. The other area that I would um, say that we're exploring is um, instead of we're, we're looking at and exploring more um, staff members with dual certifications so that uh, people might be certified um, or might have um, bilingual skills, for example, as a classroom teacher. Um, so people with multiple skill sets um, is an area that we're looking at as well. But it's um, most people don't come with that necessarily. So we have to kind of build that up or um, recruit recruit for that. All right, thank you. Let's talk a little bit about um, enrollment trends, uh, where they have been and where you see them going. The, um, yeah, thank you. The enrollment trend is um, relatively flat. I think we're uh, a little bit, um, a little bit down from last year, um, but then I say down by like 1%. Um, the number is really small um, and almost, uh, I, I, see, I see us staying pretty steady in terms of our enrollment. That's what the enrollment projection from our demographer has been. Um, and so we are keeping that in mind and kind of planning, um, planning accordingly. Um, so re we're remaining relatively flat. Well, last year, I think we had, there was a, as a growth in the pre-K to five mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then, and then six fell off a little bit. Has that, is that, are you seeing the same trend here? Yeah. So we definitely have higher numbers in, um, you know, pre-K to three, especially, um, and uh, there are more choices for students in fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. And then again, uh, in the eighth to ninth transition, we see some some choices emerge and people may choose to go elsewhere, um, oftentimes, or sometimes they do come back. Um, but the numbers at our um, K to three and pre-K to three are higher than, um, than, uh, than we're seeing elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah, we have 402 students in grade one. Wow. And we'll be graduating 355 students. So oh. most of our most of our numbers are in the mid 300s. Um, but yeah, we've got 402 in grade one, 399 in grade two, and 398 in grade three. Hmm. Well, I, th I know it's impossible to have accurate numbers, but roughly last year we had something like 4,800 students enrollment. Mm -hmm. And you yes. said that it's about 1% more? It's no, it's about 1% less. So 1% less. Although it, it bumped up because the last time I looked, it was 4817. And we're at 4830. As of today, I get a report every week. <laughs> yeah, it keeps changing. I know. And last year, I think we were 4840 or something like that. So right, again, exactly. It's, yeah. It's, um, I'm not sure it's statistically significant. Do you know if the if the pre-K to three are uh, ELLs? We have the number of, of um, 
uh, for uh, students who who have their primary language not English, were were enrolling. Yeah, it's um it's pretty consistent across the district where um slightly higher in the elementaries and the early elementaries, but about 23% of students are multilingual learners. And some of our schools, it's going to be higher than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Do any of the other members have questions or comments about this gigantic budget? I am good. I would like, um... Thank you very much, Superintendent, for the presentation. And You're welcome. Um, I have a, just a quick question on um, the the guidance that you're giving with regards to ESSER and what that uh, does to the overall, uh, I'll just call it teaching population. Is there a shift in skills that go on as you absorb um, ESSER? Uh, I'll just say ESSER teachers or funding from ESSER into the school uh, system. Does that push out or crowd out other types of teaching positions? I, I just brought to mind the librarian. I know you had the, there was some discourse about the librarian a few mm -hmm. meetings ago, et cetera. And mm -hmm. is there an effect on your overall budget where you're required to, or you're pulling in the ESSER funding, funded teachers into the system? And then I don't know if that crowds out others. I mean, it's a, it's just a, I'm not concerned about it. I'm just wondering uh, what does that have an impact at all? I don't think we're seeing that. Um, we are, you know, to we are seeing a need in the district for a more diverse set of skills among our educators. Okay. Um, we have speech and language pathologists, we have occupational therapists, we have physical therapists, we have um board certified behavior analysts school psychologists mm -hmm. adjustment counselors so uh nurses we're starting to see more lpns uh in addition to registered school nurses um so that's one piece of it um is that we are definitely seeing just a broader um a broader set of roles in our school department and people working as teams together to support students um, but also I think the world's getting increasingly complicated and we're seeing other areas of specialty becoming uh, emergent needs. Technology uh, jumps out to me as uh, an area where um, there's, you know, schools are um, prime targets for potential cyber attacks. And so we really have to make sure that we're on top of things with respect to that sort of specialty, but those folks aren't necessarily the the first ones that you think about when you think about schools. So um, we are definitely seeing a, a diverse, a more diverse um, employee pool. Is it crowding out others? Um, you know, I, I think that um, that's my fear, I guess, is that, is yeah. that we're and running that's not a loaded in. question. I, you know, yeah. some of it is just old school thinking, right? And things change, and uh, that's fine. I just, I do, yeah. I do, you know, from other areas that we've talked about on our budgets, it does tend, it has different, uh, you know, maybe an unintended consequence, right? Where you have to pull in something and something else has to drop off. So I, I that's just kind of a curious question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Tell us a little bit about school security. Sure. Um, so school security is uh, a top priority to make sure that our students uh, and staff um, are and feel safe. It covers the gamut, so it's a really big topic. Um, but it includes uh, relationships and psychological safety. Um, one of the best deterrents related to school violence and school harm is uh, making sure that people know each other and have relationships and um, can uh, report issues. We do have um, some amazing school resource officers uh, and administrators and teachers. And, um, you know, we do, you know, so people report 
um, concerns to them. Um, we do also have a, a really phenomenal anonymous uh, app that students can use to report um, concerns that they have if they're worried about um, a danger to the school, but also if, if they're worried about somebody uh, being a danger to themselves. And so um, that's called Say Something. And it um, it works very, very well. And a number of us get the alerts uh, and, and can respond. Um, in addition to that, um, we do uh, have, um, you know, physical security measures in place uh, and we're, you know, kind of keeping up with um, the need for upgrades to security cameras. Um, right now, uh, all over our capital um, plan are upgrades to doors and windows, including um, some additional physical security measures um, at the um, entryway of schools to create more of a locked vestibule approach. Um, so that is um, that's something that we are currently working on. Um, those are a few things that come to mind. Um, there's a lot more uh, I'm sure that we could talk about, but those are a few of the things that come to mind. Thank you. Training. We've been doing a bunch of training. Um, yeah. as well. And I could um, We've been working with, um, we had a big convening with the police department and multiple fire departments um, last summer with our administrative team to go through protocols and uh, representatives from all of the departments went to um, a session in Burlington, Mass recently about um, reunification. So we're kind of learning together and, and adjusting our protocols accordingly. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other members? Well, thank you very much for giving this overview. Um, You're welcome. Thank you for your attention and questions and we'll get oh, that additional. Thank you for taking the time from your really busy schedule to come with us, to come and talk with us. We you're appreciate welcome. it. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie, do you have all the information you need about the schools? Uh, not yet. Mark okay. is to, uh, Mark you can is, you can reach out to Chris Dwelly. I was, did. Yeah. I, I sent him an email and he's given me some of the information, and um, I think. What I want right now, what I'm looking for is a projection, the, a five-year projection. Um, that's probably what, um, that's the direction I want to go in. Okay. Uh, yeah. And Jackie, that's a five-year projection for all departments, not just the school department? Well, I wanted to look at the comparison of um, how, um, I wanted to look at the comparison of um, how we, like I said, the, 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 the topic that's on our minds is wastewater. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to look at Oh, you're muted, Jackie. We can't hear you. Oh dear, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to look at what portion of the um, of the budget was allocated to the school, and kind of make a comparison from that aspect. So yes, yeah, so I wanted to look at the overall. Let's say we had a um, hundred million dollars in in the pool. What portion of that was allocated? to wastewater, what was allocated to the schools and how do we how do we divvy up all of that? Um, so that was kind of the direction I wanted to go. I, I wanted to take it in a different direction than we've looked at it before. Mm. So um, I, I also looked at, um, I, also I have been thinking about the possibility, like I asked Sarah, um, what part of the budget would you cut but she also said that there was a 5% increase that was in the budget and that um, all of the monies that they were expecting from the state was not realized. So that puts us back 
that's information that I did not have before. So that puts, puts us back a little bit. Um, just, I think I'm just mulling it over in my mind, trying to find, like Lillian said, um, Lillian always talks about, or she always says, um, we, we're here to give some kind of a financial advice and I'm no financial guru. So it's testing my metal. <laughs> we're yeah. all learning together. I'm just truly looking for, like I thought about the OPEB, if there were investments in that fund that could probably be redirected to the school, but no, that's not there. So we can't do that. Um, what, what else? Um, talk about cutting costs, but if the cost is increased by 5%, then what do we do? So um, let me mull it over again. <laughs> Okay, we will have a really interesting subcommittee meeting next week. Any other further, any other comments about the school budget? Okay. Um, we've had, we've had correspondence from the committee members. Does any other committee member have anything to add? How about communication from the staff? Um, capital improvement program hearings, budget hearings start this Thursday evening with the town council. Um, I believe our department of public works is up first. And, oh. um, so they'll be taking up the whole evening the meeting starts, I believe at, uh, 6 PM. And I'm sure we'll go all the way to 11 o'clock, uh, because there are 60 capital appropriations. Yeah. Out yeah. And, there's some new business on there as well um, that they'll probably take up before they get into the capital program because some of it's time sensitive um, it, because it deals with uh, supplemental appropriations for fiscal year 24. We're trying to do some things in fiscal year 24 um, to put us in a better uh, position security wise, especially with our um, financial system. Um, we're, we're talking with IT, we're going to bring our, um, Munis financial management system onto a web based and hosted, um, platform with Tyler technologies, which is the company that provides the Munis financial system. They're going to host it on their servers. So we're transferring all the liability and security, uh, onto them by having them host it because they have the redundancy oh. um, to provide us access to that program in the event we have a catastrophic failure with our in-house server or a cyber attack. Um, you know, as, as, as Superintendent Ahern talked about, how schools are vulnerable, more and more vulnerable each year to cyber attacks. So aren't police departments, so aren't town governments. It is a uh, free for all out there these days um, for communities. And we're trying to do everything we can to reduce our exposure to potential cyber attacks. And this is one important thing because really? when we had a situation last year where our, our in-house server went down for a number of days. And when that happens, we can't produce a payroll. And, you know, that, that would impact thousands or hundreds over a thousand employees if it's a school payroll week as well. Mm. And, you know, we want to avoid that situation. So, you know, having a, having a web, web hosted um, uh, platform where Tyler has that redundancy built in. So some servers go down, they have backup servers with more backup servers. And the only thing we're, we're susceptible to under that situation is internet. If our internet goes down, then we won't have access to the program. Um, however, you can go to a place where the internet is available and we can access the program. Um, so that could be anywhere in the world where we'd be able to access the Munis system. All we need is internet. And so it, it really provide us a lot more security. And that's on the agenda uh, for the council to take up as well as the capital program. Hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Craig, do you want to give us any insights about how the 
council is going to be considering the CIP projects? Well, as as Mark said, it, it's going to be a slog. Uh, there, you yeah. know, because you have to have a uh, individual vote and uh, individual public hearing on every single one. So it, it's just going to be a matter of uh, one after the other, and uh, you know, hopefully, people have done their homework and uh, you know they they've asked the questions that they have to ask, and things will go quickly. But it's going to, as Mark well knows, and Probably most of you know also, it, it, there's a lot of capital items that have to be gone through and it, each one takes a while. It's, it's too bad we can't uh, you know, do a, a, some type of a consent agenda on them. I asked that specific question. If, if anyone had any questions on them, uh, you know, they could be pulled out. But apparently, uh, for our legal reasons, you can't do that because some of them are you know, raising money or bonding issues or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Those are the big items too coming up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I think our next meeting is May 13th for full CFAC. We may have another one the week before uh, for C the full full committee to go over the operating budget report. And Chuck will figure this out after we have had our um, subcommittee meeting on the 29th. Right, Chuck? Correct. Okay. Is there anything else to come before the committee? Not hearing any, is there a motion to adjourn? I move. Is there second. a second? Somebody seconded, right? Nobody seconded. seconded it. <laughs> yes. You like it so much you want to stay longer. <laughs> okay. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn the meeting. Chuck, will you take the roll, please? All right, Lillian. Yes. Hector. Yes. Tom. Yes. Chris. Yes. Chris wants to stay. Chris, Chris is frozen. Chris, Chris, is, frozen. Here, Chris is frozen. <laughs> Jim, he's giving me the yes. eye. Yes. Jackie. Yes. And Chuck is yes. So we're good even without Chris. Thank you very much, everybody. I thought this was really a, a great session. We got these two major budgets.